A panel of retired military and intelligence officials in testified Iran, before a House subcommittee know, about the threat from I Iran. Witnesses include Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, former chief of staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell. This is almost two hours. Probably another 20 minutes to, uh, to 30 minutes, and then we'll come back again on that, so we apologize, but uh, don't have any control, as I said. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Iran, Reality, Options, and Consequences, Part 3, Regional and Global Consequences of U.S. Military Action in Iran will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements without objection so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Again, without objection, it's so ordered. Um, Mr. Shays, I'm going to submit my uh, remarks for the record and just abbreviate them. I suggest that uh, your, record, your remarks will also be allowed on there, but still you want to hear some uh, open remarks on that. I want to, again, welcome all of our witnesses and thank them uh, for subjecting themselves to the delays, but also uh, for being gracious enough to come in. We're here to hear what I think is an extraordinary group of witnesses testify on a subject of increasing importance, the possible consequences of American mil military action against the Islamic Republic of Iran. Today is the third hearing in a series that the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs has undertaken to examine United States foreign policy towards Iran. At our first hearing, we heard experts describe the current conditions, the makeup, the complexity of Iranian society, including the largely positive public opinion there towards the United States. At our second hearing, we heard insider accounts from former senior diplomats and intelligence officials about missed opportunities and missed negotiating opportunities with the Iranians over the past few years. Today, we're extremely fortunate to have before us a group of top military, diplomatic, and intelligence experts will provide the subcommittee with what the public and the Congress have needed for quite some time, an unvarnished discussion of what could happen should this administration, before exhausting all diplomatic avenues, act to commit American forces in war against Iran. And make no mistake about it, some like to refer to airstrikes or limited military action or other sanitized and neatly controlled terms, but that vocabulary will be meaningless to the people on the receiving end of our force. The Iranian government and the Iranian people will see any such action as war, and we can expect that they would act accordingly. Although some members of this administration and their supporters have loudly proposed attacking Iran, none of them, to my knowledge, have explained what potential consequences we as a nation would be left having to manage, not only over the next year, but over decades and generations to come. History shows us, unfortunately, that it is far easier to rattle the saber than it is to clean up the consequences of a war. One need only look at a map to understand Iran's centrality to the whole host of United States national security interest. We have a map over there to, uh, to our right. We're in the middle of an expensive and bloody war in Iraq and an equally difficult and dangerous campaign to build the entire government and infrastructure of Afghanistan. One shares Iran's western border and the other its eastern. We have hundreds of thousands of soldiers who have fought and continue to fight in these two countries. We have invested hundreds of billions of dollars and diverted critical military resources. We heard at our second hearing the positive efforts Iran played in helping to defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan. We've also heard repeatedly about Iran's involvement with the Shia militia groups in Iran. If the United States attacks Iran, how will Iran and its allies retaliate? And what impact will this have on the safety of our troops and the future stability of both Iraq and Afghanistan? Instead of hard-nosed diplomacy and efforts to improve relations with Iran, or at the very least putting in place control mechanisms to avoid having small confrontations or actions spiral into major hostilities, this administration has been issuing threats and condemnations. If you look at the map of Iran carefully, you'll see that Pakistan and Turkey also border Iran, two countries that are absolutely vital to regional and global security. And many of our closest allies in the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia, lie directly across the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. But as we'll hear from our witnesses today, the potential consequences of military action in Iran do not just stop with those countries directly surrounding Iran. For example, how will an attack on yet another Muslim country further erode the United States' broader and long-term effort to win over hearts and minds in our global anti-terror efforts? How will the Arab-Israeli peace process be affected? How will China and Russia react? Will they, for example, take advantage of these American actions to swoop in and scoop up further trade and diplomatic opportunities? How will the United States and global economy react to actual or threatened disruptions in the oil supplies? especially at a time when global supplies are stretched to their maximum and the United States economy shows signs of troubling softening. 
Everyone agrees the dilemma posed for us in dealing with Iran is extremely difficult and complex. There are serious and inherent dangers, for example, of an Iran with nuclear weaponry. Among other concerns, a nuclear Iran could serve as a catalyst to a proliferation surge in the region and pose a more threatening presence in the region more generally. Iran has also supported groups aligned with terrorist sympathies, and we certainly need to continue to carefully explore the role that Iran is playing in countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan. We need to take all of these developments extremely seriously. Still, as our two previous Iran-focused hearings and numerous other forums have shown, there are significant alternatives to war that have not yet been exhausted or adequately and skillfully pursued. These alternatives should be considered as opposed to using military action as a first option or until we are directly threatened with imminent danger. But I worry that, unfortunately, the same rosy scenarios and foolhardy thinking that led us into Iraq in 2003 are gaining momentum once again with respect to Iran. I ask a simple question, have we learned any lessons? If nothing else, I hope we have learned the importance of having our eyes wide open as we contemplate the possible paths forward, especially when one of those paths has such pervasive consequences as war. That is what our hearing today is all about. The witnesses here today have been asked to testify because of their breadth and depth of their experiences. At least four of the witnesses today have served in uniform and collectively bring a wealth of personal and professional experiences. I know they bring a patriotism born of personal sacrifice and a deep love of our country and its rich heritage and strength of ideas. I have no doubt that the members of this subcommittee and the American people will benefit from the opportunity to learn from the decades of collective military, diplomatic, and intelligence experience before us today, and to do so before the drums of war drown out the ability to have a reasoned and thoughtful discussion. I want to thank the witnesses again for being with us today. We look forward to your testimony. And I now yield to Yant Ranking Member Chris Shays for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this third hearing and for holding the first two. The decisions we make about our future relations with about our future relations with Iran must be based on bipartisanship at home and discussions with our allies abroad. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has described Iran's nuclear program as more worrisome than the crisis over North Korea's nuclear weapons. He has predicted that if Iran secures nuclear weapons, nonproliferation efforts may cease to be meaningful and a world of multiple nuclear centers will be created. And he has asked, what would the world look like if the terrorist bombs in London or July, on July 7th had been nuclear and 100,000 people had been killed? Perhaps more poignant, Kissinger has said, I'm not recommending military action against Iran, but I am recommending not excluding it. Today's hearing will focus on the possibility of a military strike against Iran. While the central reason for such a strike seems straightforward to prevent this state sponsor of terrorism from acquiring nuclear weapons, the outcome of such a strike does not. So what would happen if the United States bombed Iran? The truth is, no one really knows for sure, just as no one really knows for sure what would happen if Iran acquired a nuclear weapon. Of course, none of us want either event to occur, but we must recognize the stakes are enormously high when nations like Iran espouse philosophy that is irrational. They threaten the survival of their own population as well as the rest of the world. These concerns are shared by the majority of the American people. When asked recently whether Iran poses a serious threat to the world, 85% of, Americans, of Americans answered yes. Dealing with terrorists leaves responsible leaders with stark choices that will have to be made to protect the American people and the rest of the world. But this hearing is about hypotheticals, so let's talk in hypotheticals for the moment. If the United States were to attack Iran's nuclear weapons facility, Iran would consider such an act an act of war and retaliate. This retaliation could come in the form of a strike against our allies, retaliation against U.S. and coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and maybe even Europe, and possibly a wave of terrorist attacks against the United States' interests both at home and abroad. Perceptions of the United States would further deteriorate in the Middle East and in other Muslim countries around the world. The bottom line is we would be at war with Iran, which would be devastating because what the United States and our allies do not need right now is to open another front against the terrorist state. Many experts disagree how soon Iran could acquire a nuclear weapon. Some say in five years and others say ten. Whatever the time delay, uh, there is little disagreement Iran is intent on acquiring the capability.
and if Iran succeeds and builds a nuclear weapon, what then? The Middle East would become even more unstable. The rich oil region would be dominated by a terrorist state that has announced its intent to annihilate one of our staunchest allies, Israel. As Secretary Kissinger observes, other nations would want to acquire the capability and nonproliferation would cease to be a coherent policy. Indeed, these are just some of the consequences of Iran's obtaining nuclear capability. Last week, the Crown Prince of Bahrain uh, said the Iranians are seeking to develop nuclear arms and called on world leaders to find a diplomatic solution. I agree with the Sheikh. The United States has an obligation to find a solution other than war, and we as Congress uh, have an obligation to support the current administration and whatever administration follows in their efforts to find this solution. But in the meantime, we cannot allow terrorist states to acquire the means to blackmail the entire world. So to return to Kissinger's insight, while we should not be recommending military action, we should be, recomm we should be recommending not excluding it either. We welcome all our witnesses today and look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Shays. We're fortunate to have with us this morning Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, Colonel Samuel B. Gardner, Dr. Paul Pillar, Elon Berman, and Lieutenant General Paul K. Van Riper. Uh, we're going to start uh, with the testimony of Colonel Larry Wilkerson, who is the visiting Pamela C. Harriman Professor of Government at the College of William Mary, as well as professional lecturer in the Honors Program at the George Washington University. His last positions in government were as Secretary of State Colin Powell's Chief of Staff from 2002 to 2005, and Associate Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff. Before, before serving at the State Department, Colonel Wilkerson served 31 years in the United States Army, including as Deputy Executive Officer to then General Colin Powell when he commanded the U.S. Army Forces Command in 1989. Special Assistant to General Powell when he was Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from 1989 until 1993, and as Director and Deputy Director of the United States Marine Corps War College at Quantico, Virginia from 1993 until 1997. Colonel Wilkerson holds two advanced degrees, one in International Relations and the other in National Security Studies. Before the Colonel starts, I want to invite anybody that wants to take their jacket off to do so. It's pretty warm with the uh, Klieg lights in here. We're talking about witnesses as well. We're witnesses <laughs> as well. And uh, ask unanimous consent that, uh, that uh, Mr. McDermott, who's not a member of this particular panel, but who has uh, joined us here today, be allowed to participate. Without objection, so ordered. Colonel Wilkerson, we'd be happy to hear your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having me here, and ranking minority member Shays and other members of the subcommittee, thank you. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to start and preface just by saying uh, I'm a soldier. That's the perspective I'm going to be speaking from. I'm a strategist. I was educated as a, stra as a strategist, uh, and that's an important distinction. Strategists aren't trained like infantrymen. They're educated. Uh, it's a very, very meaningful distinction, as a matter of fact. Um, and what I want to, the perspective I want to come from is that you have my written testimony. I just want to focus on one aspect of it. And that aspect of it is let's assume political, diplomatic, informational, cultural, and other instruments of our national power have failed, and we do have to resort to military force. Despite the lack of a substantial and ready land component, because we wouldn't have one, it's tied down in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere, what would be the consequences of using such force? Because it would be limited to air and naval power, perhaps complemented by a few special operating forces, to prevent Iran's possessing a nuclear weapon. For that latter purpose is the only ultimate objective I can conceive of, as ranking minority member Shays has pointed out, to use military force against Iran. The result of using such force, in my view, would be disastrous. I'm a soldier. I'm speaking from the intellect and the heart. Land-based air power coupled with sea-based air power and small special operating forces deployed in Iran would conduct what I would call a network-centric type campaign that is using highly developed target maps. They would devastate the existing grids in Iran, railroad, air, railroad, air, electricity, gas, information, communications, command and control, and so forth. Or, in a more limited way, these forces would concentrate, take out Iran's air defenses, as probably they could, and then do what damage they could do to the nuclear facilities that we're aware of or that we suspect. My question in both cases, widespread strikes and these more focused strikes, would be to what purpose? At best, the limited strike scenario would set back Iran's nuclear program a year or two, perhaps a little longer, 
More likely, it would spur the Iranians, as strategic bombing did the Germans in World War II, to round-the-clock determined efforts that would swiftly make up for lost time, might even uh, make the program even faster. We may recall that German production actually increased after massive bombing raids by the Allies in World War II. The more widespread strikes, while devastating, and they would be, would solidify a nation of 70 plus million people, a great number of whom are under 35 years of age, a nation that is anything but solidified in its views right now, particularly amongst that age group, and the uniting factor would be nationalism and a visceral hatred for America. The ranks of the Revolutionary Guards would swell, asymmetric warfare at a time, a place, and with a means of Iran's choosing, not ours, would break out wherever U.S. forces were vulnerable, but particularly in Iraq, Qatar, Kuwait, and elsewhere in the Gulf region, at a minimum. At the end of the day, what would America have gained by doing this? My answer is very little, except that we would have fallen into one of military history's most common traps. We would have reinforced strategic failure, one of the oldest, most consistent failures throughout military history. From the Persian to the British empires, there exist enough examples to give one pause. From the Persian, uh, from Xerxes to Mark Anthony, from Napoleon to Hitler, from World War II uh, to Vietnam, World War I, history is replete with leaders who simply could not say, either tactically, operationally, or strategically, enough, and sacrifice more blood and treasure by adding to that failure. Unless we are prepared to invade Iran with sufficient ground forces, thoroughly defeat the hundreds of thousands of guerrillas that we would most likely encounter, occupy the country for at least a decade or longer, more and deeper failure is the most likely consequence. That's the only conclusion as a strategist and as a military man that I can come to. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, just for everybody's information, there is a vote scheduled on a motion to adjourn, uh, and that's a single vote on that. We're going to continue to keep the meeting uh, proceeding along. Uh, so if people want to go and vote and come back, we'll continue in, in place on that. Uh, our next uh, witness is Colonel Sam Gardner, United States Air Force, retired. Colonel Gardner is a war strategy scholar and former faculty member at the National War College, the Naval War College, and the Air War College. Colonel Gardner has designed and participated in numerous war game simulations involving Iran, including one to be broadcast on CNN in early December. Colonel? It's a net assessment. Uh, essentially, it's from the net. What I'm going to say is nothing classified. I've told Iranians directly to their face that they need to fear the Americans will strike. What I'm telling you, I've told them. This is the headline we want to avoid, the headline of the future in which a president is faced after a series of U.S. actions with a decision to go for regime change. He's faced with no other option. There are two military objectives we normally see set out in when we talk about conducting a strike against Iran. Punish the Iranians for terrorism. This is new. It has more importance than it did six months ago. The second, and obviously, is to set back the nuclear program. Let me talk a little bit about targets and the likelihood of success. In the punishment category, obviously, the Revolutionary Guard units come to the top of the four interesting about the Revolutionary Guard units we don't hear much talk about. They are prepared for an airstrike. They are heavily bunkered and heavily revetted. It would be very difficult to put punishment on them. This is the same unit. They're spread out. Second option, go after the terrorist training camps. Not much infrastructure there and not much com uh, density of personnel. Not a very good target. My assessment of the punishment option Here's what I would say after we got through with that. No serious damage done to the, the guard units. The strikes on the terrorist training camps didn't do any damage. Iran continues enrichment and doesn't change its view of the world. Okay, let's go after the nuclear facilities as the other alternative. Uh, you need to understand the one big weapon that plays a part in this. This is the penetrating 5,000 palm conventional weapon. Uh, First target one comes to mind is the Natanz enrichment facility. This is the way it looked five years ago. The two halls will be buried with two meters of concrete, 18 meters of dirt, uh, 60 feet underground. This is the way it looks today and the way the U.S. would have to target it with 
con this conventional penetrating weapon, probably putting two weapons on top of each other. Next target would be the nuclear research facility at Esfahan. Uh, interesting this happened in Iran right now is they are moving from just dig and cover to tunneling. Makes targeting much more difficult. Harder for us to destroy even the nuclear facilities now. This is the kind of targeting would have to go on. Obviously, the heavy water facility at Iraq would be targeted. And again, what one finds is tunneling and making the targeting difficult. Here's the third or the final facility I'm going to talk about, which is the missile test facility at Parchin, uh, where they also do weapons testing. Again, what you see is heavy tunneling uh, to interfere with targeting. This is another interesting part about Parchin. I raised this. I do not know the answer to this. They are more careful about protecting the facilities there than they are about protecting the nuclear facilities. I suspect it has to do with chemical weapons. I'll mention that later. Bashir would not be targeted. No reason to kill Russians. It's not important to the nuclear program. Here's my assessment after that. We can destroy three to five years of construction. We know how long it took to build those. But the effect on the nuclear program, as Larry Wilkerson said, uh, we may accelerate it. Uh, as a strategist, I would say you don't take military action when you don't know the outcome. Uh, it's very questionable. The next thing that comes to mind is if you're going to strike the Iranians, then you've got to make sure, this would be the argument, that you get their ability to retaliate so that they can't come back. Uh, these are the F-14s at Esfahan, the alert F-14. We would want to strike those. More shelters and bunkers, heavily sheltered and bunkered Air Force. It can be destroyed. This is the main naval base at Bandar Abbas. Three Russian-supplied Kilo submarines and a mini submarine. Those would be targeted in this elimination of the retaliation capability. The missile patrol boats at Chabahar would be targeted. The Iranians have a series of anti-ship missiles. These are the probable locations. The anti-ship missiles include the old silkworm as well as the C-805 that was used by Hezbollah to attack an Israeli ship. They are heavily bunkered. Now, they're stored in bunkers. They have sites that are revetted where they would fire from. We would probably strike the missile launch areas, uh, the same launch areas that the Iranians used during the Iraq-Iran War, uh, where they probably have some Shahab missiles. After all of that happens, uh, most of the aircraft would be destroyed, large naval vessels would be destroyed, but we would be facing small boats, terrorists, chemical capabilities, and some missiles. Let me talk about consequences. The Iranians have a number of options. Little or no response, and this is an interesting one. I'm going to talk a little bit about this because that's a powerful option. What I call the low DNA violent attacks or then a broader response. No response, very interesting, and my metaphor is the Danish cartoon example in which the Middle East and even Europe became enraged by those cartoons. You would find the same thing happening here. Some governments might even be threatened by the severity of the reaction. And again, that's without any Iranian retaliation. We have said the Iran Iranians are... Uh, if we attack them in a national intelligence assessment, like Iraq, that we could expect uh, major improvement or increase in terrorists. We have said that the high likelihood that they would uh, initiate attacks inside the United States. Uh, we would find, we would be asked to escort uh, ships in the Gulf. We would be asked during this process to provide additional missiles to Israel and Gulf states. And the oil pipelines that are in Iraq would be vulnerable uh, and could very easily see that as being targeted. We would see additional infiltration into Iraq from Iran, and we would see additional U.S. casualties because of that. We could very well see more naval mines in the Persian Gulf. Not a heavy mining capability, but just a few would cause problems. We could see the Iranians use speedboats to threaten oil tankers. We could see insurance rate and oil prices jump. Most people talk about a spike. But it's important to remember that they may, that may not be in the Iranian interest. Recall during the Iraq-Iran war, we actually had a price plateau. Uh, that is something that they would more likely want to see. The range of things they could do beyond that is broad. 
uh, and will probably depend on the severity of our strikes. But involved in this, we have to understand, is they have threatened attacks inside the United States. Remember, Iran has WMD now. This is not something new we're talking about. They probably have this range of chemical capabilities. Uh, this special storage facility at Esfahan is probably where they store them. Uh, when we talk about Iran providing nuclear weapons to terrorists, I think we have to be able to answer the question, why haven't they given chemicals to terrorists? Uh, I can't answer that question, but that's an important question to answer. Brings me back to where I started. Uh, it's possible for a president to be put in a position where he has no options. Caused a sequence of events where uh, it's not just that our options aren't successful, but we're in a point where we have to do regime change uh, because his options are no longer limited by the violent uh, extreme which follows. Well, thank you very much, Colonel. Uh, our next witness is Dr. Paul Pillar, who served for 28 years in the Central Intelligence Agency, including as National Intelligence Officer for the Near East and South Asia from 2000 to 2005 and as Deputy Director of the CIA Counterterrorism Center. He holds a master's degree and a PhD from Princeton University and currently serves as a visiting professor in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University. Mr. Pillar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, as Mr. Shays correctly noted in his opening comments, no one can accurately predict exactly what the consequences of any U.S. military strike on Iran would be. But in my judgment, there are good grounds for assessing that the risks of major damage to U.S. interests from any such action are substantial and that the probability that such damage would occur is high. I'm going to hit highlights from my uh, written statement in four areas. The first is the likely Iranian regime response. A U.S. attack probably would make acquisition of nuclear weapons capability appear all the more attractive and even necessary to Iranian leaders and would motivate them to work even more assiduously to acquire such a capability sooner rather than later. One of the likely principal reasons for Iranian interest in such a weapons capability is as a deterrent against external threats, which in Iranian eyes includes first and foremost the United States. A U.S. military attack therefore would be for Iranians the most dramatic possible demonstration of a need for such a deterrent. An instructive lesson, in addition to what Colonel Wilkerson mentioned about World War II, was Iraq's response to the Israeli airstrike in 1981 that destroyed the Iraqi nuclear reactor at Osirak. That response was not to give up nuclear efforts, but to redouble them. Iranians, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Shays mentioned it as well, would consider any military attack on their territory as an act of war, and they would respond in times and places of their own choosing. Colonel Gardner has already covered uh, a whole range of plausible possibilities. I would just highlight two in particular. One would be responding inside Iraq, where Iran over the past four years has assiduously cultivated influence with a wide variety of Iraqi groups. So far, Iran has not fully exploited its position in Iraq to make maximum trouble for the United States. But following a U.S. military attack on Iran, Tehran would have less reason than it does now to exercise any restraint at all. The other likely form of asymmetric Iranian response would be international terrorism, including possibly attacks in the U.S. homeland as well as against U.S. targets overseas. Iran retains a formidable terrorist capability in the form of its own state agents as well as the help from clients such as Lebanese Hezbollah. In recent years, it has held that capability mostly in reserve. But a U.S. military strike against the Iranian homeland would be just the sort of contingency for which this reserve ca capability has been retained. As for other political consequences inside Iran, any U.S. military strike would be a boon to Iranian hardliners, such as President Ahmadinejad, whose political strength rests in large part on a message of threat from and confrontation with the United States. A U.S. attack also would make it substantially more difficult for Iranian leaders of any political stripe to do anything that could be interpreted as a concession or a positive gesture toward the U.S. And I might add, finally, that an attack could also be expected to affect long-term attitudes of almost all Iranians. Just as Iranians still today, more than half a century later, refer resentfully to the U.S. instigated coup that overthrew a populist Iranian prime minister in 1953, a military attack, which of course would be an even more open and violent act of hostility, would be a new source of long-term resentment, helping to poison relations between Tehran and Washington for generations. 
turning to the surrounding region and repercussions that would extend even beyond the Middle East to the rest of the world, most governments in the Middle East would oppose U.S. military action against Iran, both in their public rhetoric and in their privately expressed sentiments. The Gulf Arabs, for example, do not focus their attention on the distant possibility of an Iranian nuclear weapon. Iran has conventional superiority over them anyway. They worry more about such things as restiveness among their own Shia minorities. And they would also have to worry about how their conspicuous ties with the United States could work to their disadvantage in the event of another intensely unpopular U.S. military operation in the region. And intensely popular it indeed would be, not just in the Gulf, but elsewhere through the Middle East. Like the war in Iraq, it would be widely viewed by many people in the region uh, as an assault by the United States, the leader of the Judeo-Christian West, against Muslims. This perspective toward the Iraq war would increase the likelihood that and an attack on Iran would be seen similarly. When you look at repercussions going beyond the Middle East, again, a look at the Iraq war gives us clues as to the likely impact of an attack on Iran. Much of the world would view such an attack, like they view the operation in Iraq, as an unprovoked and unjustified exertion of raw power by the world's only superpower. And given particularly the unhappy experience we had with allegations of weapons programs in Iraq, as well as U.S. tolerance of nuclear weapons in the hands of ourselves and our allies, many would see the U.S. action as a blow not against proliferation of weapons, but against a Muslim country with a regime that Washington doesn't happen to like. So the dominant global consequence, in my judgment, especially in the broader Muslim world, would be an increase in anti-Americanism, which has been documented in so many polls so far over the last four or five years with regard to the impact of uh, the Iraq war. Another U.S. military offensive in the Middle East would strengthen and lengthen this unfortunate trend. All of this is speculative and hypothetical, of course, but in weighing the risks of an action as drastic as a military attack on another state, we cannot afford to limit ourselves only to what is readily measurable. Some of the consequences of such an action would be no less serious and no less detrimental to U.S. interest, even if they can only be inferred and not forecast with certainty and precision. And in that regard, I would note that any hope for benefits of such action also cannot be forecast with certainty or precision either. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Our next witness is Mr. Elon Berman, who is the Vice President for Policy at the American Foreign Policy Council. He's a member of the Committee on Present Danger and author of Tehran Rising, Iran's Challenge to the United States. Mr. Berman has consulted for both the Pentagon and the Central Intel Intelligence Agency. Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me take the opportunity before I start to thank you and to thank uh, Congressman Shays for the opportunity to be here. Sure. Um, you have my written statement and, and I'd like to submit it for the record. Uh, I just want to walk through a couple of points that I made therein. Um, from the outset, I think I should be clear, I'm not here to advocate in favor of a military option with regard to Iran. Personally, I think that such an option, if it is attempted, would have tremendous consequences, adverse consequences for the United States, for American interests, and for American al allies in the region. Uh, in part, that's because there are a lot of things that we don't know or can predict, reasonably predict, uh, as Dr. Pillar said. Uh, the first is uh, the question of knowledge gaps with regard to the Iranian nuclear program. We know that over the past two decades, the Iranian regime has placed a premium on building a massive national nuclear endeavor, uh, pursuing both uranium enrichment and plutonium separation. But there's a great deal of actionable, in actionable intelligence that we still don't know about that program. And as a result of that, uh, as a practical matter, this means that the idea of denuclearization, a complete elimination of the Iranian nuclear capability, is simply not on the table. Uh, rather, uh, the best that we can hope for, the best that we can hope for, is to delay and to defer Iran's nuclearization, but not to derail that project completely. The second issue that needs to be taken into account uh, relates to potential responses on the part of the Iranian regime. And we heard uh, from the previous witnesses a, a uh, rather exhaustive list of what could happen. I, I would only add my voice to that list and say that with regard to Iran's capability to project asymmetric harm on U.S. troops and coalition partners, with regard to Iran's ability to uh, increase its support, ratchet up its support for terrorist groups, and as well as Iran's strategic location atop the Strait of Hormuz, uh, this is a, a pretty dramatic uh, ca uh, countermeasure on the part of the Iranian regime that could be harnessed in the event of a conflict. Uh, the third, and, and in my estimation, the most decisive uh, counterindication for military action actually has to do with the situation within Iran itself. Um, 
by all indications, the Iranian regime is wildly unpopular, uh, polling at uh, a very, very low success rate um, and popularity rating. Uh, but the nuclear issue is not. The nuclear issue is actually a very popular issue. And it's, in fact, a popularity that transcends both ethnic and sectarian lines in Iran. And this means, as a practical matter, that uh, even though uh, this is an issue that has essentially been harnessed by the regime, it's a regime initiative, not a populist initiative, it's one that uh, is both supported by ordinary Iranians and by regime hardliners, although for very different reasons. And as a result, this means that external action on the part of the United States or uh, another country would be seen uh, as uh, a, an unacceptable external intrusion. It would harden domestic opinion in support of this program, and it would actually have the practical ancillary effect of strengthening rather than weakening the regime's hold on power, which I think we can all agree is probably not the desired outcome. But I think it's important to point out here that the elephant in the room is the character of the Iranian regime itself. Nuclear technology is not inherently good or evil. Uh, its ultimate disposition rests upon the character of the regime that will wield it and what it plans to do with it. And we know that the Islamic Republic is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, and its intentions are, to put it plainly, malignant. And this is why pol the White House, this White House, as well as politicians from both uh, sides of the aisle, have uh, spent a lot of time uh, insisting that the wor one of the world's most dangerous regimes is not, which should not be allowed to acquire the world's most dangerous weapon. And by the way, they are joined by a growing slice of the American public in this, uh, in this viewpoint. Um, the latest uh, poll by uh, Zogby International, uh, released just last week, uh, suggested that 52 percent of Americans now support the idea of military action to prevent Iran from going nuclear, although the reasons for their conclusion that this is a good idea would vary. I would uh, point out that there's uh, a number of issues that need to be raised when we think about the ultimate disposition of the military option and about whether or not to take it off the table. Personally, I believe that it cannot be taken off the table for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, because without the credible threat of the use of force, the United States will undermine the other economic and diplomatic strategies that it's currently pursuing. Simply put, Iran is not likely to bend to sanctions if it thinks that all it has to do is weather sanctions and then there's nothing else coming down the pike. And as a result, uh, the regime will become convinced that there will be no consequences to its continued intransigence. And this is not a constructive position for uh, us to take. Uh, without the credible threat of the use of force on the part of the United States, you also have a, a, what amounts to a dangerous domino effect that will begin to take shape in the region, indeed is already taking shape in the region, in which a growing number of Iran's neighbors feel compelled to pursue a nuclear program of their own in an effort to counterbalance the emerging Iranian bomb. And the end result of this, I want to be clear, will be not one nuclear Iran, but many. Uh, also, without the credible threat of the use of force, the United States will need to rely upon a deeply flawed deterrence paradigm for dealing with the Iranian regime. Uh, this is a paradigm that fails to account, at least in its current state, for communication gaps between Washington and Tehran, uh, fails to account for a lack of understanding of Iranian strategic intentions, and most of all, fails to account for this uh, new and deeply troubling messianic discourse that's beginning to emerge on the part of at least one segment of the Iranian political elite. And I would argue that uh, that in particular, all of these elements, but that last one in particular, uh, makes Iran undeterrable in a conventional sense of the word, if you're uh, a fan of uh, game theory and deterrence theory like I am. Um, and the last uh, point here is that without the credible threat of the use of force on the part of the United States, Iran will soon be able to extend a nuclear umbrella to terrorist groups that it supports. And the practical consequence of this will be a vastly greater reach and weight for groups like Hezbollah. Uh, and the threat that they and others can pose to America, to American forces, and to American allies. And at the end of the day, uh, it's clear that the military option for dealing with Iran is at best deeply flawed. At worst, it's dangerous. Uh, any calculus of its potential costs, however, uh, I believe, needs to be weighed against the likely results of, do of us doing nothing. And those results, in my estimation, are the emergence of a new regional order in the Middle East dominated by an atomic Islamic Republic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, our final witness is General Paul Van Riper, who served uh, with distinction for 41 years in the Marine Corps, including as Commanding General of the United States Marine Corps Combat Development Command and the first president of the Marine Corps University and the commanding general of the 2nd Marine Division. General Van Riper received numerous decorations during his military service, including the Silver Star with Gold Star, Bronze Star with the Combat V, the Purple Heart, and the Legion of Merit. 
Uh, General, I have to say I, I read all of your testimony and, and found it uh, incredibly informative uh, and, and quite a history uh, and on, on that. And I know you won't, uh, you won't be able to read all of that into the, into the record, but I, I hope people take the opportunity uh, to read it on their own and to go to the website or whatever because it was incredibly informative. And we look forward to your remarks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I welcome this opportunity to speak with you today. Your effort to widen public discussion about the direction of our nation's defense policy is, in my estimation, long overdue. I'm going to summarize the three issues which I discuss in the longer paper, but encourage the members, as well as those outside, to uh, look at the extracted material that I include in the third section, which speaks to a different way or a different method of tackling difficult national security problems. Let me speak first to a national discourse. Americans need to know that war is much too serious a matter to leave to the generals, or for that matter, to senior elected officials. The decision to wage war and the manner in which it is conducted must be the concern of every citizen. Today, I do not detect the same wide interest in issues of national security among our citizens as we have seen in the past. Someone recently observed, and I think correctly, the military is at war, the nation is at them all. We must reverse this indifference. Only through open and candid discussion can we develop better national defense policies. To my second topic, developing these national security strategies. If we truly are in a global war against <coughs> radical Islamist insurgents, and I am convinced we are, then we must think in terms of a global strategy. We must view the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq and the potential for conflicts in such troubled spots as the Horn of Africa, Southeast Asia, and Iran as part of our global concerns. Thus, the United States requires a well thought out and generally understood strategy for the ongoing worldwide war. Let me note, the administration speaks of a global war on terrorism. Terrorism, along with guerrilla warfare, is simply a method. What we have is a global insurgency. We now have so many national strategies that our efforts are diffused. Some might even say confused. One contemporary source shows nearly 30 national strategies. The public is largely unaware of all these documents, but if they were, they would find a bewildering array of policies, goals, and objectives. Even as a professional soldier, many of these individual strategies, strategies perplex me. In their totality, they are beyond my comprehension. The story of how we arrived at today's sad state of affairs is important to understanding how we might improve our situation especially when currently there is talk of war with Iran. If there's time during the question and answer portion of the session, I would like to outline that story for members of the committee. In one sentence, I am convinced that the advancement of any number of inane ideas over the past 15 years undermined much of the conceptual work done after the Vietnam War and directly contributed to the faulty decision-making leading up to the invasion of Iraq. My third issue. We need a new approach to tackling difficult national security problems. America is a nation filled with problem solvers who seem to favor analytical or engineering methods. An analytical approach is a powerful one for those difficulties who are under, whose underlying logic or organizing system is linear and structurally complex. It is inadequate for a second class of problems, and Iran would certainly fit this. Those whose underlying logic or organizing system is dynamic, nonlinear, interactively complex, or as some literature refers to them, wicked problems. The interactions of these sorts of systems can and often do produ produce unanticipated and disproportionate results. What leader could have imagined in June 1914 that two pistol shots fired in Sarajevo would set in motion all the events leading up to the horrors of the First World War? If we understand these complex problems, we ought to grasp that taking action in national security settings frequently creates multiple reactions that for any practical purpose are unknowable beforehand. Appreciating this, our nation's leaders should be more humble when forecasting the results of specific actions in the international arena. Certainly this should be the case when they contemplate confronting Iran or any other nation 
with military force. Until we undertake a discourse about the contemporary U.S.-Iranian situation that includes authorities from many fields, I will remain unconvinced that any projection about the effects of military action are anything other than conjecture. <clears throat> the chairman's opening testimony in this subcommittee's meeting on 30 October 2007 serves as an excellent example of how to begin to grapple with the complex problems presented by Iran. I urge the subcommittee members to continue to view the current situation with Iran as a wicked problem that is interactively complex. If the legislative and executive branches were to engage in a widening discourse on this vital issue, I believe we would see American government at its finest. Certainly this is a course of action that every American would want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The you know, we really shouldn't uh, applaud one way or the other. All of the witnesses have done an excellent job in, in sharing with us their information on that, and we could spend a lot of time uh, doing that, but we, we do appreciate it. There is another series of votes, as you heard, on the alarm uh, going off, uh, two votes, in fact. Uh, I thought what I might do is ask my five minutes of questions here, and then we'll take a little break and come back, and others can uh, vote, and then we'll do that after that, but we will suspend uh, after that. Let me just start by, by asking generally the panel. I, I think we can assume that neither Iran or the rest of the world is unintelligent, uninformed, uh, and they're all pretty much aware of what the United States military capabilities are. Uh, given that fact, uh, I think there's a question as to what value is added to any diplomatic or other efforts we might make to resolve these issues by continuing to very loudly uh, rattle the saber uh, and, and heighten the intensity of our rhetoric uh, about the military option. Anybody care to uh, respond to that? Does, Dr. Pillar? Uh, Mr. Chairman, in my judgment, it uh, works to the detriment of the diplomacy in a number of respects. Um, that is to say, it makes it less likely the sanctions will work. Number one, it makes uh, a nuclear deterrent seem all the more worth uh, striving for in the eyes of the Iranians. Number two, it helps the political position of the hardliners. Number three, it makes all Iranian leaders of whatever political stripe find it politically more difficult to do anything that makes it look like they're making nice toward the United States. And uh, finally, it, it cements the view that I'm afraid too many Iranian leaders already have, that there is simply no hope of a better relationship for the United States, even if they did improve their behavior on a nuclear weapons, Iraq, or anything else. So it detracts from the diplomacy. It does not add to it. Carl? I would just add one thing. I think the thing that they're concerned about is not the military instrument, but the fact that they believe it means regime change. I hear this from Iranians a lot. What we need to take off the table is regime change, which we have not taken off the table. Well, let me ask another question. Could, you know, what do we make, and, and Colonel Gardner, you mentioned this in your remarks, that the Iranians presumably already have weapons of mass destruction and biological and chemical agents. What do the members of the panel make of the fact that they've never shared those, to our knowledge, with any terrorists to date, and how does that line up with a fear of, that they might share nuclear materials with them? Uh, General, you want to start, and we'll move from right to left. Mr. Chairman, I have no special expertise on Iran or the Iranian situation, though I have played a red commander in a country very similar to that. Uh, I think it's something we need to always fear, uh, but I don't think it calls at this point for any serious talk about going to war. Thank you. Mr. Berman. Thanks, sir. Uh, by way of uh, explanation, I, I think it's worth uh, remembering a historical anecdote from the recent past. Um, uh, in September of 2005, about a month after uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was elected, uh, ascended to the Iranian presidency, he uh, addressed the General Assembly uh, in New York. And uh, most of you may remember this as the speech in which he talked about the fact that he was surrounded by a green light and nobody blinked for half an hour. Uh, the speech that I was more interested in was the speech that he gave immediately afterwards. And in that discussion, he said, yes, my government, my country is pursuing this technology, nuclear technology. And not only that, but we stand ready to share it with any and all comers in the, in the Islamic world. Uh, this, uh, just to be clear, this is proliferation is declaratory state policy. And well, I, it, it, I just told you, that's Mr. Ahmadinejad's comment, not necessarily state policy. If we understand the complexities of the Iranian political structure, I think there's very likely two different things. Well, that's certainly true. I would say that, that uh, if he has his way, and you know, there's an awful lot of tea reading going on about his exact place now in the hierarchy, I could certainly make the argument that he's less of a marginal player than his predecessor. 
uh, in the decision-making structure. But that's obviously for the experts to decide. I would say only that uh, there's great merit to taking statements like that at their word, especially because the real center of gravity in the Iranian political system, the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, actually did not say that those comments were out of line or that they were out of step. He actually confirmed them at a later a, a discussion, a later time. So I, I think on that issue, there's probably more consonants than dissonance within the Iranian political spectrum. It bears taking them seriously. Thank you. Well, Dr. Pillar, then why aren't we worried about them having the biological and chemical, if, if that's a concern? Uh, we should uh, be careful to distinguish between uh, the rhetorical and what's actually in the self-interest of the regime. And I would note that not only has Iran not passed any of these unconventional weapons to clients or terrorist groups, but there is no known instance of any state passing any kind of unconventional weapons, weapons of mass destruction, so-called, to a terrorist client group, even though this is what we talk about lots and we seem to fear uh, quite a bit. And there's a substantial record on this, including most of the history of the Soviet Union, which, of course, had radical clients, and they had all brands of unconventional weapons. The reason is, when you ask what it would be the interest of such a regime to pass some such weapons to another group where they would lose control, the interest simply isn't there. It's all disadvantage rather than advantage. They lose control, uh, and if they were ever used, a group that's known to be a client of Iran, say Lebanese Hezbollah, would automatically be assumed by Washington and everyone else uh, that they would be acting on Iran's behalf. So there's simply no advantage to it. The colonels, do you have something you want to add to that? Or I, I would just say that um, uh, two things. Rational leaders, we're not talking about Ahmadinejad, we're talking about Khomeini, uh, Rafsanjani, the council in general. Uh, and two, deterrence. It works. Well, thank you. We're going to stand adjourned for a couple of minutes. And again, I thank you for your indulgence. You may have three more. Uh, back in session. Thank you again for your indulgence. I'm told that we have at least an hour before the next vote, which I take with a grain of salt, but think we might get close to it on that base. Um, Mr. Yarmouth, you're recognized for five minutes. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was curious as to what I think it, you made all made a pretty compelling case that the military option would lead to some rather dramatic repercussions around the world. In your experience dealing with in the media, what do you think the odds are that uh, those in the decision-making positions in the administration understand what you understand? Well, I'll take a shot at that because I think I probably differ with some of the people here at the table having, having been somewhat recently a member of this administration. Um, I don't think they have any plan whatsoever to use force. I think the rhetoric you're hearing now, the uh, hard noises, if you will, is designed primarily to try to regain some leverage vis-a-vis -vis Tehran. I think Dr. Rice eventually has got her orders to do something along the diplomatic track that makes a difference. And we're just trying to regain some leverage before we do that. Whether or not that's the right thing or not, I don't know. And whether it, it presupposes that we will remove this stipulation that they cease enrichment or any activities even resembling it before we come to the table uh, makes a big difference. Because if we haven't, then anything she might embark on is useless. Mm -hmm. Other opinions? And actually, I wanted to know if they, uh, I'm assuming they know what you have just said. And, uh, understand all of these potential outcomes. Uh, although, in terms of the Iraqi experience, it doesn't indicate that they particularly were aware. <clears throat> That's thin ice, but I'll try it anyway. Um, it's very difficult in the heat of decision making, and I say this from watching people make decisions even in the hypothetical situation of war games, to look at second and third order consequences. 
I can promise you I can reproduce bad decision making very easily by putting people under pressure and giving them a complex problem uh, like Iran or giving them that situation where you see that some Americans have died, now what do we do? Uh, so th there is a real dilemma that as security issues become more complex, that we find ways for decision makers to bring sort of the second and third order consequences into their consideration. Uh, Mr. Yarmouth, if I can comment on that, as you correctly noted, uh, the recent experience with Iraq should not give us a lot of encouragement to assume that certain things are uh, borne in mind by decision makers, although I suppose the, uh, the silver lining in that particular cloud is, given the recency of the unhappy Iraq experience, all of us, members of Congress, the press, and presumably senior people in the administration are a little more attuned to these things. But just one other comment to follow on to uh, Colonel Gardner's comment. We haven't really addressed uh, yet in this session um, directly. Uh, what I think is one of the main hazards that we face in this climate of extremely uh, tense relations between the United States and Iran, and that is uh, a military clash breaking out uh, inadvertently or as, as escalation from some incident, even if neither Tehran nor Washington uh, had planned it in advance. And it is, it is in those situations that the point that uh, Sam Gardner made about uh, not bringing to bear some of the secondary and tertiary consequences uh, you're likely to see. Yes, and uh, if either of you two would want to elaborate on that, that's fine. Yes, General. Sir, uh, I take uh, exception to what my professional colleague, uh, Colonel Gardner, says about second and third order effects, and this is what I tried to uh, include in my written testimony. This is typical, I believe, of American decision making. That, that is to think that there's any ability to trace these effects. I normally use a very simple example to illustrate what I'm talking about in these nonlinear systems. Anytime you go to war, you're in an interactively complex nonlinear system from a physics sense. And I try to illustrate, if you took a bounded problem, which is a chessboard, opening move, there are 400 potential opening moves. At the second move, it's 72,000 potential moves, and then goes in the third to nine million, then to some 315 billion, and all the moves the, on the board exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. So the hubris that even in war games or in discussions that we have any real idea of what's going to happen <clears throat> in second and third order effects. The best metaphor for thinking about this are not like mach machinery, like what happens if we have a problem with an airplane, but an ecology that we really don't, uh, we really don't understand. The more we study an ecological system, the more likely we are to do something in the positive. I would say what happened in the case of Iraq, there was an assertion if we put energy into the system in terms of an invasion, it would be all a happy outcome. We did not understand that system of the Middle East. And what, <clears throat> what I would urge is the only way you get to the insight in these problems is through a wide discourse with people with great and varying backgrounds to try to first frame the problem. What is the problem? We've narrowed it here this afternoon to nuclear weapons. That, that's a pretty narrow view of it. And even in some of the testimony that's been given by witnesses, it comes down to an either or. I think we've got to widen the system we're looking at and, and have a wider discourse to get to the real issues. May I just follow up real quickly, Mr. Chairman, and ask where does that go on? I mean, is, is that type of thinking and analysis typical of what goes on in the White House or Defense Department, any White House or Defense Department? I'm, I'm obviously not privileged to what happens in those uh, locations. I think as we look at our history, certainly uh, in the early stage of the Cold War, there were these sorts of discussions, both academics, those from the political <clears throat> arena, military, e economists, historians, all brought together to wrestle with these problems. And it's what happens is in the discourse, you begin to understand the logic of the problem. And until you understand the logic, there is no counter logic, i.e. no answers. They're mere assertions. Uh, and that's what I think we're seeing. We're seeing mere assertions. If I do X or Y, this is a likely outcome, or this is the risk. Uh, not, not so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yarmouth. Uh, Mr. Hodes, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, Ms. McCollum, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I want to take this, this discussion that we're having and uh, back just a little bit so I can see my paper. Thank you. I'm going to take this discussion and um, uh, just just get into it a little deeper. So a lot of us feel it's very likely that some minor scrimmage or event uh, could cause military conflict to con escalate into something much broader. So there might not even be time for uh, the Congress to debate before uh, th this administration or any ad administration would, would react to, to events on the field. But this environment that we're in currently right now is, uh, it's very harsh and the rhetoric is very, very heated. So any minor skirmish taking the rhetoric with it I see the escalation happening potentially very, very quickly, and it, it's very worrisome. So under what instances do you think we might see something escalate so that we could be prepared? I mean, the, the whole issue with the um, Iranian Guard comes up uh, quite a bit with them supplying weapons or them crossing the borders. But do you know? I mean, have we put circuit breakers in place? Uh, you talked about the Cold War. I mean, there were opportunities for the governments to, to talk to each other. Are there circuit breakers in there so that we could uh, uh, stop uh, an incident from uh, escalating out of control? Do we have any diplomatic back channels? Um, and I'd like to hear a little more about how you think the State Department and the Pentagon can anticipate uh, the threat and try to work to get ahead of it to set up some of these safeguards and back channels. Then the other incident that could happen is uh, we, the, the nation of Israel has talked about leaving all of its options on the table with Iran. What would, what would our reaction be to that? What should our reaction to that um, be in order to keep um, being drawn in and to work with Israel to keep them from being drawn into uh, raising uh, the confrontational uh, dilemma there? Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. I, I just want to uh, back to your question, Mr. Yarmer. Um, the untoward incident occurring uh, is also a concern of mine. And I, I think the, uh, the circuit breaker we have in place, the best circuit breaker, is Admiral William J. Fallon, Fox Fallon. I think he's imbued with all the possibilities that might happen in the Persian Gulf region. And I think his commander's vision out to his naval forces, who are the forces in proximity most apt to start something outside of Iraq, um, is just that, to avoid it, to avoid it, to avoid it. We don't want 15 British sailors to be replicated with 15 American sailors or whatever. That said, I'm still very concerned about the proximity of forces, as I'm sure he is. It probably keeps him up at night thinking about how close they are and how an event like you were, just, you were just describing, could take place and be a casus belli. Um, I take some confidence from the fact I do not believe the Vice President is in charge of national security policy anymore. Um, I believe others are. Uh, the Vice President is still a very uh, influential voice vis-a-vis -vis those policies, but I don't believe that is in the first administration he's basically in charge of them. And so that gives me some confidence that military commanders Secretary Gates and others will take the kinds of actions that are necessary to tamp something like this down fairly swiftly and even more importantly to prevent it from happening in the first place. Uh, if I may, uh, I, I think you hit upon something that's uh, critically important here, uh, which is the sort of where are the most likely flashpoints. We've had uh, a discussion now for about an hour and a half about <clears throat> the question of uh, the nuclear program and is that a casus belli and what can we do. I happen to believe that uh, Iranian involvement in Iraq, in operations against coalition forces in Iraq, is the most uh, immediate way, uh, place where the rubber meets the road, where there's a potential for, for a crisis. Uh, 
particularly because of the reports that I hear from uh, coalition commanders, from combatant commanders, uh, about uh, the degree of Iranian involvement in uh, the funding of both Shiite and Sunni militias uh, active now against the coalition. Um, my recommendation would be to say that, that there is much work that still needs to be done to forge a serious counterinsurgency strategy, not simply against the Sunni insurgency, as we've done and we've discussed and debated, but also about Iranian infiltration into Iraq. And that actually, uh, if you were talking about circuit breakers, has the ability to uh, contain a skirmish if it does come out into, uh, and prevent it from uh, expanding into a full-blown conflict. Uh, Ms. McCollum, if I can comment on both parts of your question. One, with regard to circuit breakers, although I, we're hap I'm happy to have someone like Admiral Fallon as the internal circuit breaker in our government, uh, I think your question uh, implies partly an argument for uh, dialogue and engagement with the Iranians. And if we can't have something as full-blown as the hotline that we did with Moscow for years and years, at least talking to them beyond the extremely limited talks we've had uh, between Ambassador Crocker and his counterpart in Iraq would be one way to get a circuit breaker. On your second question with regard to what Israel might do, uh, my comment here would be uh, the perceptions of the Iranians and other people in the region, again, would matter most. And the widespread perception would be anything Israel does would have been done with U.S. connivance. And there would be some actual physical, logistical, operational bases for assuming that, including possible uh, use of Iraqi airspace, where we're the people who really control it. If I could add just quickly to two of the points. One of them is there's reason to be optimistic after some of the events of the last week. The release of the Iranians that have been captured, a portion of them from Reveal, the public announcement by military officials that we have had less IEDs, less attacks, and then Admiral Fallon's testimony in the Financial Times. That is a major circuit breaker that was put in. Uh, you know, we've, we've narrowed, we've pulled back from the edge with the Iranians, and I think that was an important thing. As far as the, the Israel's concerned, if I go back to sort of the military dimension of the problem, they will, the Iranians would have left over the capacity to do us severe damage if Israel does that without our involvement because they do not have the capability to destroy all those retaliation capabilities. We must make it clear to Israel uh, that we won't tolerate them doing this by themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCollum. Mr. Shays, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Again, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate you having this hearing, and I appreciate our witnesses. I, I learn more, frankly, from witnesses who don't necessarily get classified material, because then they can talk about what we all read in the New York Times. I can't talk about what we read in the New York Times because I'm told sometimes uh, at a classified briefing. So it's sometimes I choose not to be get those briefings. Um, but uh, I, I want to ask a number of questions. Uh, first, I, I think uh, if we uh, ended up using military force in Iran, it would be uh, a huge setback uh, for us in the world. Uh, I don't know if we are going to position ourselves where that appears to be the only option. Do you all agree that you have basically three ways to deal with the issue? You talk through diplomacy, you have embar sanctions and embargoes, and you use military force. Are those basically the three categories? Is there another one I can add? Yeah. Mr. Shea, uh, I think any time we begin to categorize, uh, again, we narrow down horizon. I, I think at this point- Are you gonna give me another option? Uh, besides if, those three, if I, I only have five minutes. Is there another one that I'm not I'm missing? I'll give you a little longer time if the, if okay. the general wants to respond. Yeah. If, if I did, sir, I would be doing the same thing. I'd just be adding to your categories. What I'm suggesting is that we do something like the Future of Iraq project that was done by the State Department prior to the invasion of Iraq, but was never utilized. That we have a, a wider discussion that brings those sort of folks in and, and Th these are mental models we're constructing. So, for but you're, you're arguing for the diplomacy and the talks and that. That's fine. But, but I'm just asking, is there any other than those three? And you're not adding to the list. No, sir. W what I'm coming from, I'm coming from Clausewitz's dictum. It's usually translated as war as a continuation of politics by other means, meaning you supplant the other means. The better German translation is... You're making an argument to me, I think, that you can avoid using military force by other th uh, other means. With an admixture of other means is the better okay, translation. Okay, well, if, if the answer is no, I'd like to get on to the more important question. 
that you have basically three ways to deal with it, diplomacy and all the art of dialogue and so on. You have sanctions and you have a military use. And you have all these options within each group. And you disagree with my categories, and that's fine. But those are the three that I know. I'd now, throw one more out okay, there, fine. Uh, Mr. Shays, and that's what I would call information, and that's what you're doing right now. Good. I think that's a good one to add. Thank you very much. Um, in the end, uh, I happen to believe that you should have embassies in every country, and there should be no requirement on what uh, you do to get an embassy. In other words, we should have one in North Korea, we should have one in Cuba, and we should have one in Iran. I think, to me, that's one of the big lessons I've learned in the past few years. If we had an embassy in Iraq, we would have known how pathetic, for instance, their infrastructure was. And, and to be honest with all of us, uh, we don't just have state employees in our embassies. So it would have been uh, hugely helpful. What I take, uh, I found myself reacting, Dr. Pillar, to your comments that, you know, tell me a country, there is no record of any country giving a nuclear uh, weapon to a terrorist. And I'm thinking, well, that's true. And so I thought, well, that's kind of convincing. And then I thought, there was no record of any uh, country or terrorist organization attacking the Twin Towers and bringing down Twin Towers and taking, uh, attempting to take four planes. There was no record of it. Uh, we could have said, we don't need to fear that. So I don't take the same comfort you may take in it, because frankly, there aren't a lot of countries that have nuclear weapons. As we expand the list, it's very possible uh, that we will see a new paradigm. I, for instance, think that, you know, Al Gore is right. There is this inconvenient tooth of global warming. And I think, frankly, too many of my Republican colleagues don't want to deal with it. I frankly think too many of my Democratic colleagues don't want to deal with the inconvenient truth of the 9-11 Commission, which talked about Islamist terrorists who would do us harm. And I feel like we're, we're dealing with a different group, and I don't think those old rules. So I'm just responding to, to your comment about it. North Korea and Pakistan gave weapons to Libya, Iraq, or excuse me, technology to Libby, Libya, Iraq, and Iran. Have they given them to any other country that we know of? Mr. Berman, any others? I'm sorry, sir. It doesn't uh, roll off the tongue. If you give me a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, come up with a list. I, I would say that the, the level of... But those are the three primarily, correct? Yeah, the primary ones, yes, sir. There were, there were others involved in the AQCon network, but I'm not even sure I can talk about that here. Okay. Um, unfortunately, you had a classified briefing, so you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the thing that I found the most uh, significant is that, um, that a military attack might set back a nuclear program two to five years. Um, that was, I think, given by you, uh, Colonel Gardner. And do you all agree that that's the, the extent of, of what would happen? Could, could I, I said the construction three to five years. See, we don't, we, we can't know how. In other words, if you don't bomb, if you don't kill their scientists and their technology, you've just dealt with the construction aspect. Yeah, that, that's the only thing we can be precise about. And, it, and, and, yes. and so the reason why it worked a bit in Iran was it wasn't their scientists building the plant, the weapons grade material plant in Iraq when, uh, when uh, Israel bombed it. In other words, there it, it lasted far more than two to five years. No, it actually accelerated. I'll go back to... Uh, I heard his comments, but with all due respect, um, they did not build a weapons-grade material plant. They stopped and didn't build one, correct? They did other things. They needed to still get the weapons-grade material, correct? Who was the uh, and gentleman, and I'll end with this, who was the gentleman that was, was it you, Mr. Pillar, or the other statement, or it was you, uh, General Riper, who said that it accelerates the effort? The, the experience after the strike on the Osirak reactor was Iraq switched from a plutonium cycle right. to a uranium cycle, and then we saw what the result was 10 years later after but, Operation But the problem Desert was Storm. that they needed to get the weapons-grade material. And, there, and so the effort to prevent them from getting the weapons-grade material plutonium, uh, that succeeded, didn't it? Uh, Mr. Shays, I was making a point about the effect on incentives and okay, whether... Okay, but I'm making another point, and you can answer that. They did succeed in stopping them from getting the weapons-grade material, correct? No, sir, they didn't. Uh, Iraq uh, redoubled its efforts using the uranium rather than the plutonium route. And did they have weapons-grade material? They or came, they came uh, no, scaring, the answer is, scaringly... No, the answer is no. The honest answer is no. They had the technology to build, but not the weapons-grade material, correct? 
not as of 1991. You're right, sir. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Mr. Hodes, you uh, want to continue passing, or do you want to go? No, I'm ready. Thanks. Mr. Hodes, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Um, I, I really have no idea who my colleague, Mr. Shays, is referring to when he suggests that there are people here who don't understand uh, the threat of terrorism that we face and are dealing with, especially in the post-9-11 era. It seems to me to use a term that um, uh, 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 General von Riper mentioned, we have an interactively complex situation uh, in the Middle East now, made worse by uh, our uh, quagmire in Iraq. Um, we have uh, a resurgent Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, we have uh, not enough uh, force and effort in Afghanistan. Pakistan is in turmoil with uh, an ongoing question as to how it will shape up. We have involvement with Iran. Uh, in Syria with Hezbollah and Hamas and a festering Israeli-Palestinian situation. And in the middle of that mix, we have the possibility of a, a nuclear uh, weapon-armed Iran, um, which uh, adds to this stew. Um, do any of you have confidence that the United States currently has an adequate and articulable national security strategy to deal with this situation? Directly answering your question, yes and no. They don't. Thank you for that. That's a great start. They have a horde of them, as was pointed out by one of the panelists, um, and none of them make a lot of sense to me. Um, and I've read most of them, if not all of them. Um, and this is most discouraging. Back to a point made earlier, there is only one place in your government including you and this body, where strategic thinking goes on on a routine basis. That's in the policy planning staff of that pink old commie bunch of people at Foggy Bottom. <laughs> Nowhere else in your government does strategic planning go on. So that's part of the answer to the question why we don't have a coherent, uh, reasonably logical strategy for dealing with all the challenges we confront, not the least of which is uh, terrorism presented by people like Al-Qaeda, Jamai Islamiyah, and others who are intent on doing us harm, which I might add is probably an insignificant number of people in the world. And yet we're not focused on that very insignificant group of people. We're, we're instead running it across the globe. Um, you didn't even mention in your litany probably one of the most serious things happening today, and that is in the heart of Europe where people are planning, using the civil liberties that exist there, which in some countries even exceed our own, using those to do planning, to get together, to do the kinds of nefarious things that Al-Qaeda did to us and that were done in Madrid, in Bali, and in London. And battle-hardened veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan are going to Europe to fill their, uh, their ranks out. This is very dangerous. Anybody else want to comment on whether or not you believe there is a comprehensive national security strategy? General? Sir, as I mentioned in my testimony, I did a web search and I found 29 strategies the U.S. government has produced that have national security or national security strategy in them. Uh, until the Goldwater Nichols Act, 1986, there, were no, there was no place those of us in uniform could go to find a national security or national military strategy that was rectified in 1988, the first national security strategy was produced. For those of us who taught strategy, that was a, a wellspring, because we could go back and talk about how you could come from that document, work your way through military objectives and then military action if needed. We had a, <clears throat> before we had a, a deficiency, now we have this excess. As I indicated, I don't know what they say, uh, if we were permitted to return questions to the, <clears throat> to the panel, uh, mine would be how many panel members have read any one or even uh, of these uh, strategies. Most important, though, even if we'd all read them, how many American citizens have read them, how many American citizens understand them, stood them. Even as a six-year-old in World War II, I had some glimmering that we were fighting in Europe first, <clears throat> and then we're going to fight in the Pacific. As a teenager, I understood what we were attempting to do in terms of uh, the Cold War with Korea. Uh, 
and certainly during the, the Cold War, I, I understood and with my fellow students could talk about massive retaliation, flexible response. When I go on campuses today, I don't see those sorts of discussions about national security. As I said, the nations at the mall, only the military is engaging in this in small, small groups. We need a national discourse. Let me just follow up. To the extent that anybody can discern from the large number of strategies that you've talked about, some sense of a national security strategy, is anybody satisfied that, that what the administration is contemplating, talking about, thinking about, and doing about Iran fits in to any comprehensive, articulable, and organized strategy um, that would help bring members of Congress along or the disengaged American populace to understand um, what threats we're facing, how we intend to face them, and why we're doing what we're doing? My response would be absolutely not, sir. Mr. Berman? I, I would concur. I, I think what we have with regard to Iran is not a strategy, but several strategies that are being pursued by separate elements of the bureaucracy, uh, economic, uh, economic punitive measures, uh, diplomatic measures, and others. Um, there is nothing uh, resembling a coherent uh, framework in which all of these can be integrated, in, as they, at least not as of yet. I have just uh, two points to connect. One of them is, uh, the, one, going back to the question on fire breaks or circuit breakers, if we had a strategy, it would help the Iranians understand our behavior better. I do not know, I can't articulate the United States red line for Iran, meaning at what point we would use force. It has been said we can't allow them to have nuclear weapons. But in his last press conference, the president said they can't have the knowledge to produce nuclear weapons. By that red line, we have crossed and we should be using force against Iran. We can't be that sloppy in our discussion of what our policies are with respect to Iran. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you. Uh Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just note that in the, uh, in the General's uh, testimony in line, he said, in the last six years, the Defense Department seems to have placed more emphasis on tactics and operations than designing meaningful strategy. I think that's exactly what you were getting at, is they might have tactics about what they're going to do, but they haven't fitted into a strategy on that. That's why we're having another series of hearings in this particular committee, and I think some of you are aware of that, running parallel with this, on what is our strategy going forward uh, in the, the full world arena on that, on this and a host of other issues, and how does it all fit in. Well, Mr. Mr. Lynch, you're recognized for five minutes. May I, may I just reinforce that for a second? Certainly. Take a minute. Um, when Ambassador Richard Haas and Secretary Powell sent me over to the Pentagon to establish joint staff liaison with the policy planning staff of the State Department, I encountered the military building its national military strategy. Rumsfeld subsequently forbade us at State to come back to the Pentagon or the Pentagon to come to State. But when I encountered it, I asked the man in charge of building the national military strategy how he was doing that in the absence of a national security strategy. He said, it's tough. Mr. Lynch, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I'm am among uh, a group of us here that believes that there should be uh, some dialogue at some level with, uh, with Iran. Uh, we are all very careful not to undermine our State Department initiatives and, and uh, the, the, the general policy, if you call it that, uh, coming out of the State Department today. Uh, are there examples in the past where uh, I, I'm sure uh, during the Cold War there was talk about dialogue uh, going on? Uh, we've been approached, some of us in this committee, uh, by uh, members of the Bundestag and other members of the European Parliament to, to engage perhaps some members of the, the moderate uh, uh, political bent in, in Iran, and yet there, there's uh, some reluctance there because of uh, uh, the position that uh, the State Department has taken, and we, and we don't want to undermine their, their central role in, in setting national uh, policy. Uh, what, are, what are some of the solutions that you might see in terms of uh, your own experience, your own uh, knowledge of history and how we've handled this in the past? Is, is there a way to go f forward to, to establish some type of dialogue, even recognizing the, the absolutely offensive positions that have been taken by Ahmadinejad, uh, you know, publicly? 
Uh, Mr. Lynch, if I can uh, respond, we don't even have to go as far back as the Cold War. We have a sterling example in Libya, uh, which led to the tripartite agreement between Libya, U.S., and U.K., which in my judgment was uh, a foreign policy success for the Bush administration and the Blair government. And what happened there was uh, we talked to them. And there were, at that time, secret, but now it's, it's been made public. And this does go back to my personal experience, because I had the privilege of being part of the uh, initial rounds of secret talks that began in 1999, which led then finally to the, uh, the agreement, uh, which resulted in the dismantling of the uh, Libyan unconventional weapons program and their becoming a partner rather than an adversary on terrorism. So the two key lessons to take from that, number one, we talked, and number two, we talked with an open agenda. We discussed everything of concern to us about terrorism, about Gaddafi's rather erratic diplomacy, and about unconventional weapons. And we also talked about the things that were on the Libyans' mind as well, and we eventually had success. And I give the administration a lot of credit for that, by the way. Mr. Berman? Uh, if I may, sir, uh, I, I would add one caveat to Dr. Pilar's uh, uh, comments. Um, I think uh, it pays to take a look at the political center of gravity within the Islamic Republic. It's quite clear that the current nuclear crisis is uh, reaching a point in which uh, the compulsion to do a deal on our part is actually very great. We would like very much to avoid a conflict. We would like to reach some sort of negotiated settlement. Um, I think, uh, <coughs> as I often say, there, there's really only two things that you can escape. You can't escape geography and you can't escape demography. Iran is a country of 70 million people in which two-thirds of the population, 50 million people, are 35 and younger, which means they've lived all or most of their lives under the Islamic Republic. And they are uniformly, according to all sorts of polls done by both uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, disaffected and uh, discontented with the current state of affairs. I would be very careful to articulate a negotiated settlement that makes those people, that constituency, view us as having abandoned support for them in favor of support for a regime that is frankly unpopular and swimming against the tide of history. Can I just pick up uh, sure. on those very same points? Um, Iraq is the hegemon in the Persian Gulf. By demography, by size, and a number of other factors that the strategists would look at. We recognize that. That's the reason we overthrew Mossadegh in 1953 with Kermit Roosevelt, Frank Wisner, and a bunch of leftovers from the OSS in World War II. We then installed the Shah, and for 26 years, we fed that hegemony. We fed it with $20 billion worth of arms from Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. Um, read Robert Dalek's book, and you'll understand just how significant this transfer was. We almost decided to give them nuclear weapons. Whoa. Then comes the revolution, and all of a sudden, we've got a different set of people in Tehran. That doesn't change the fact they're still the hegemon. And we need to recognize that. Iraq, of course, balanced them for a while. We took Iraq's side in the Iran-Iraq war. We did. Iran would have beaten Iraq had we not done that, um, even though Iraq had strategic, operational, and tactical surprise on Iran when it attacked. Um, so they are the hegemon. We need to recognize that. And we need to deal diplomatically, economically, and otherwise with coming to some kind of accommodation with that very real strategic reality. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Sam? Mr. McDermott. I think you need to put your microphone on. The up position is on. Is that right? It there is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, John Kennedy got into the Bay of Pigs, and then when it came to the Cuban Missile Crisis, he said to his brother, hey, get everybody in here on all sides of this issue. Let's have a little talk about it before we go off in any kind of strange way. It seems to me we're in a similar kind of situation here, and I want to ask about a process that I, I hear people talk about, never sat through one, don't know what they really are. Uh, they're called war games. Uh, how many of you have actually participated in a war game? So you've all been through one. Um, the possibility, uh, I know Mr. Uh, as, as Colonel Gardner is putting one on CNN here shortly. Uh, what about having the Congress go through that process over in the caucus room in uh, the Cannon Building or down in the basement of the White House, uh, uh, Capitol, uh, and let us actually experience it? Tell us what that would do for us 
in terms of us letting, if we're the ones that are supposed to declare war, like the Constitution says, because what scares people like me is the people in the White House right now say the president has enough authority to go ahead and do whatever he wants in Iran. And I still believe the Constitution is correct, that we have the right, but we really don't know what the options are. I mean, we're, this is as close to an exploration of the options as will happen in the United States Congress. I'd like to ratchet it up one level. Tell me about a war game for all of us. <laughs> um, sure. I started teaching at the War College and became dissatisfied with the way students understood strategy after the traditional teaching methods. I began wargaming uh, because uh, for two, th two reasons. Number one is there, there's a very fundamental thing about adults learning. Adults don't learn when they're told. I mean, you will remember 10% of what I tell you uh, within an hour, but within two days you won't remember anything. If you participate in the process, if you experience the process, if you have a sense for the decisions, uh, I will tell you that you will understand the situation better. That's the first thing I'll tell you. The second thing I will tell you, I know by experience and having done this with people who have served in the White House, who have been chief of staffs in numbers of administrations, will say, wow, I had no idea till we did this what I learned. And I, I used in my briefing an example that came out of one of those games for senior people who said, I see now, if we start down this road, eventually the president will be put in a position where he has no choice but to go for regime change because the situation will unfold to that thing. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that I think uh, you begin to see understandings for. I, I think... Um, you know, there, there are techniques, and, and I will, and let me just build on what General Van Riper says. He used the term wicked problem. That's a term that architects use. And what architects talk about a wicked problem, they don't mean you back away from it. What architects say a wicked problem, it's like the design of a room. You don't find a solution analytically, but you try different arrangements until you say, wow, I got the furniture in a good place. The only way you can do that is by trying, exercising, and participating, I think. That's what diplomacy is all about. And, and can, is it possible? Could you take 25 of us, picked randomly from the floor, and put us through a roar game and come out with a positive, and let the American people see it through television and the press and whatever watching it, General? Sure, I, I would encourage a step before that, though I certainly would encourage what you are suggesting. The uh, term before was mentioned, strategic planning. There's a wonderful book by Henry Mintzberg called The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning. And what he points out in all fields in our society, government, industry, academia, uh, those in the senior leadership positions find themselves so busy with day-to-day -day activity, they walk away from setting the strategy and turn it over to the planners. And planners do what they do best, they plan. The analogy I would use is a skipper of a naval vessel who would say to his navigator, pick the port and chart the course. That doesn't happen. The captain picks the port and observes as the navigator charts the course. So strategic planning, as he says, is an oxymoron. What we first need is to involve the most senior leaders in this. Otherwise, it'll be the same thing. It'll be a plan that they have no investment in. The, the second step after we persuade the national, the very top national leadership to be involved in your game is to become informed on the problem. There's no use starting the game until we understand, number one, what is the problem and what's the context, how have we framed it, how have we set it, how have we formulated it, and then there might be some hope of gaining something from that game. But we are always trying to smell the flowers from the back of a galloping horse. How do we do that first step? How do we get the, the leadership and, and the committee chairman and whatever that might be necessary? Or could we have some benefit from just using ordinary troops like us? I'm not optimistic at this point, and I'm on this side of the committee for, my, uh, for 60 years as I voted. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 50 years as I voted. Uh, but I'm not optimistic. Uh, 
And the, uh, the reason I'm not optimistic before the term information or information operations was used, we hear that, we hear public diplomacy, strategic communications, all that is in the realm of technical or tactical. We as a nation have lost the strategic narrative. Our president has lost the strategic narrative. I find it sometimes hard to believe what he's telling me, and I'm from his party. So until we regain the strategic narrative, I'm not sure how we can tell our story around the world and, and be credible. So as much as I would encourage this intellectual activity prior to the game, I fear uh, we may have to wait for another year and a half before it will be of benefit, which may unfortunately be too late. Thank you, Mr. McDermott. We're going to uh, allow one question per uh, member of the panel here since we've gone through for the five minutes once. Uh, and I just want to raise one point with General. The PBS program Nova and uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book Blink featured vignettes of the gigantic $250 million Defense Department war game called the Millennium Challenge in 2002. I think you mentioned or alluded to that in your remarks. In it, they say that you revealed how, as the leader of the enemy forces, you inflicted enormous and unexpected casualties on the American fleet and ground troops invading a country in the per Persian Gulf. This apparently displeased the Pentagon leadership so badly they stopped the exercise, refloated the sunken ships, and revived the dead, and started over with a script requiring you to do as they expected. You refused. Would you tell us what the lessons of that war game were and the lessons of the Pentagon's reaction mean to us when we're considering what's going on here in Iran? First, let me uh, precede by saying that was the most corrupt thing I ever saw uh, the American military do. The good news is I never saw it before. I have not seen it since. Uh, I do not believe with the new leadership, and I am very encouraged by the new secretary, the new chairman. Uh, I'm very encouraged with uh, General Jim Mattis, who took over the Joint Forces Command, which is where this particular game was played, uh, that we would never see something like that again. Uh, under the previous leadership in the Pentagon, they did not seem the least bit interested uh, in what might have been gained from that, that particular game. There was an idea at the beginning, preconceived as how it was going to be. It was billed as free play. That is, I, as the red commander, military commander, would have a great deal of, of latitude because they were so convinced these non-ideas uh, would work. When they didn't, they simply scripted it to a pre-ordained <coughs> conclusion uh, which I would have had no problem with until I saw them brief congressional staffers and brief the media that this was still a free play exercise and these, as I described them, non-ideas had proved successful. Unfortunately, those ideas are like a virus. They're permeating our military forces now, n not to the good. Uh, and, and I think is one of the reasons we haven't had the serious strategic discussions in, from the uniform side in the last five to eight years. Thank you, General. Mr. Shays, your question. Thank you. Um, which way did that? Thank you. Um, I, I want to read you a quote from Mr. Sarkozy, and I'd like to, uh, and, and uh, Chancellor Merkel, and I'd like to get your reaction. There will be no peace in the world. This is from Sarkozy. This is, there will be no peace in the world if the international community falters in the face of the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Iran is entitled to power for civilian purposes, but if we allow Iran to acquire nuclear weapons, we would incur an unacceptable risk to the stability of the region and the stability of the world. And German Chancellor uh, Merkel said, Iran is ignoring the UN sanctioned uh, council resolutions. Iran is blatantly threatening Israel. Let's not fool ourselves. If Iran would acquire the nuclear bomb, the consequence would be disastrous. Uh, this isn't President Bush or anyone else. These are two pretty cautious leaders for the most part. My question to you is, can any of you see a circumstance where you would recommend to the President of the United States to use military force uh, in order to prevent um, uh, Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons? I'd like each of you to answer that question. Let me start by, by saying that uh, I would then ask Mr. Sarkozy and Angela Merkel, as I did Joska Fischer when he made similar comments, how many German troops, how many French troops? Fair enough. And the answers were not very good. That's a great answer. Thank you. I, I would answer it in probably not a direct way that you would like. What I would say is we've got to keep reminding ourselves this is not a crisis that is coming down on us immediately. You know, they're having trouble with the P-1s. 
that's a long path to make a weapon. Uh, you know, I, you know, we got to remember we've got some time. Uh, so I, I think that there's, you know, we, I always preface this, you know, what we don't have a crisis other than of our own creation right and now. Neither of you ruled out military force, but you're suggesting that there's time. There's, you, you're, you're suggesting that other people need to put their oar in the water too, so on. Uh, Dr. Peller? Uh, Mr. Shays, I think you correctly identified in your opening comments what I would regard as the main downside of an Iranian nuclear weapon, and that is the impact on proliferation elsewhere in the Middle East. And I agree with your earlier comments that when you look at Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and so on, there might be a cascading effect. But uh, exactly the point that Colonel Gardner mentioned, there is not something we are facing now or probably even close to it. And on the issue that was raised before about deterrence, deterrence works. It does not depend on a specific ideology or degree of extremism or lack of it. You know, deterrence worked with the likes of Stalin and Mao. And even though there is so much in the current Iranian leadership which, which is anathema to us and which we consider extreme, they are not suicidal. Um, and that is the basis for, um, for deterrence working even with the kinds of uncertainties that Mr. Berman correctly mentioned before. We haven't had the whole uh, decades to build up a strategic doctrine like we and the, uh, the Soviets did. But we're dealing with that situation in South Asia, too, with the Indians and Pakistanis. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I would take a very different view of the uh, feasibility of deterrence uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, among other things, because uh, I, I find it uh, facile uh, to the extreme to assume that the same value on human life uh, that we impose upon our own society, that we uh, c calculate as part of our strategic calculus, uh, is applied on the other side. I, I think um, if uh, there's plenty of evidence in the public record uh, on the part of not only Mr. Ahmadinejad, who is correctly uh, perceived as not quite the most stable player in the Iranian game, that's absolutely true, but uh, with regard to others as well, key senior players that are seen as rational, R uh, former President Rafsanjani, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, that would give one pause uh, if we were to seriously think about whether or not it would be credible to assume that if this regime acquires a nuclear capability, we would, under any conceivable circumstance, be able to prevent them from utilizing this we these weapons and be able to um, prevent them from acting hostilely or being more emboldened. Let me get the general sense. Thank you. War is certainly an instrument of policy. And there are occasions, unfortunately, when it's the only instrument that's going to work. I think in terms of Nazi Germany, there was no other answer in, in that era. I don't think, though others have used that analogy, that we're at that point at, at this particular time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Uh, Mr. Yamath, do you have a question? Uh, yes. First of all, I want to, since uh, Mr. McDermott mentioned uh, Article One of the Constitution, I want to um, give him one of my buttons here so that he can wait around. I agree totally with... Uh, Characterization of the, theor the authority. I want to just uh, follow up on something Mr. Shea said, and, and, and the whole issue of preemptive war and um, whether the, the, the president's mention of knowledge of the atomic bomb. I mean, the, the formula for the atomic bomb was published in a Madison, Wisconsin newspaper 27 years ago. I mean, uh, everybody has access to how to do it. Uh, so that would be a pretty um, low bar to reach. But I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious as to whether. Uh, the, the issue of whether just the mere possession of atomic weapons uh, sets a standard for preemptive war, which is uh, has serious ramifications in maybe other arenas. Or we, or we risk if, if we were to engage upon uh, military action simply because a country possessed, no matter how dangerous, possessed an atomic weapon. Does that have ramifications beyond that setting? Who are you asking that? Um, yeah, Mr. Wilkinson, Colonel Wilkerson seems like he's anxious to answer. No, I, so. I just, I've got to run, and I just want to make one comment. <laughs> um, I think this may sound like semantics, but I don't think it is. It certainly isn't for a soldier. Um, there's a difference between preventive war and preemptive, pre preemptive war. Preemptive war, uh, if it's provable, is even recognized by Article 51 of the UN Charter. Um, this is preventive war. Uh, this is not preemptive war. There's no proof that the weapon is there ready to be launched at the United States or Israel or anybody else. You'd have a hell of a time proving that in a court of international law. Um, that might not be very comforting, but it does mean this is a different calculus that we are starting with regard to war. And I, I would submit as a soldier it, and a citizen, it's a very dangerous calculus to enter. So possession by itself would be inadequate without proof that there was an intent 
uh, an imminent attempt I to, I to use it. I think you'd have to have convincing proof. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hose, one, I think we may be able to one question before we go to vote if everybody keeps to one. I'll keep it to one. Um, given what we saw in our efforts in Iraq in terms of lack of planning and preparedness, what's your sense um, on the level of preparation and military planning that has been done to defend against the full range of potential Iranian reactions in, contrary, in contrast to planning for U.S. offensive efforts on Iran's nuclear sites. Uh, Dr. Piller. Uh, certainly not uh, privy to the plans. I, I think probably on the military side there's been more planning than on some of the other dimensions we discussed, the political and the diplomatic. But, uh, you know, Iran, I think, has been uh, a presumed foe in a lot of military planning that's already gone on. But the question would probably be uh, things having to do with uh, availability of resources and so on, given our continuing commitments in Iraq. Thank you. Mr. Lynch, you have a question? A very quick one, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, during the, uh, the Soviet uh, invasion uh, of Afghanistan during the 1980s, uh, the United States, uh, largely the CIA and larger, largely uh, in a secret effort, supplied training to the Mujahideen, supplied Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen, supplied training to, to the uh, tribal leaders there, Stinger missiles being used to shoot down Soviet uh, helicopters. Uh, a lot of that was just below the, the surface, but I'm sure that a lot of folks Included the Soviets knew where that was coming from. Now we are we are uh, trying to trying to stop Iran from acting in a similar, just below the radar uh, effort against our own troops, supplying weapons, supplying training against our forces. By our conduct on the region, have we forfeited the moral high ground to complain about that type of activity uh, that that's going on right now? Who would you like to answer that question, Mr. Lynch, because we have time any, for one. Anyone who would be crazy enough to answer it. <laughs> I'll, I'll be crazy. All right. Thanks, General. I don't know, but there is enough in the open literature to suggest that the United States is backing groups that are conducting operations inside Iran right now. Um, and there, there are a number of mentioned, the MEK, the PJAC in the north, the, sort of the offshoot of the PKK. Uh, the Iranians write about it. The Turks write about it. Uh, Seymour Hersh has written about it in The New Yorker. Uh, there has to be an element of truth in my mind. Well, there's a lot of activity going on thank you. around that uh, Iranian border, no question about it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lynch. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. McDermott, do you have a final question? Uh, Colonel Wilkerson, you uh, were in the State Department who created the plan for what we should expect in Iraq after the war. Uh, it was thrown away by the Defense Department. Is there anybody or has anyone done a similar thing about Iran that is hidden somewhere or buried in a wastebasket somewhere or that we can get our hands on? The future of Iraq project uh, is well known, as you just yes. indicated. Um, what is not well known is that General Hoare, General Chris, General Zinni, and a host of other Central Command commanders had some rather elaborate planning for what's called Phase 4, should we go to war with Iraq, which everyone thought was at the top of Central Command's list for contingency planning and deliberate planning. For going to war with Iraq. Right. Okay. Uh, with Iran, the same thing exists. I would, I would be willing to tell you, almost you know, take an oath to it, that the Central Command commander has on the shelf a plan for war with Iran, a number of different iterations of that. He's probably got it down, dusting it off, and working on it right now. And there is a phase four. Um, and that phase four would probably indicate to you everything we've said here today, how nothing, astronomically difficult it will be with the resources we have to carry out that plan. But nothing in the State Department plan. similar to what? I don't, I don't think there is. I'm not aware that there is. There are experts and so forth, but I don't think they've done the kind of planning with regard to that country that they did with regard to Iraq. And that thank is only much. available I want to thank to my the colleagues. That the only intelligence committee can get that data? I, they should be able to. Thank you. Thank my colleagues for their questioning and thank each one of the uh, panel members, Colonel Gardner, Colonel Wilkerson, Dr. Pillar, Mr. Berman, and General Riper, Von Riper. Thank you all very, very much for your expertise. This hearing will be replicated on our, uh, our website where people get to see the transcripts of all three hearings, including all the testimony here.
on http colon backslash backslash national security dot oversight dot house dot gov backslash uh, and we hope you will take advantage of it the testimony that you gave us today was i think very significant and helpful as we try to determine policy moving forward thank you again for your time and for your patience during the various votes thank you meeting is adjourned thank you This morning on C-SPAN 3, Army Secretary Peter Guerin and Army Chief of Staff General George Casey testify before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Watch live coverage.